Dr. Stephen Mansfield is the consummate example of all that this university hopes to produce in its graduates. What is it that we say to you all the time, go into every person's world? Dr. Mansfield has been in the ministerial world as a pastor and as a Christian leader, in the entrepreneurial world as a business leader, in the political world as a consultant, and in the literary world both as an author of some renown and as a consultant also and a producer. I want to first of all introduce to you his wife Beverly, who is just in the front row here. Would you please stand? And now I'm going to ask you, as we always do, to honor our guest speakers. I want you to stand up on your feet and welcome Dr. Stephen Mansfield. Just once at ORU, I'd like to have an introduction that I don't spend the rest of my life living up to. Could we just lowball it once? That would be awesome. I want to thank you undergrad, or you guys who are here at ORU as students for welcoming us, uh, us alums. You are much nicer to the alums than I was when I was at school. <laughs> I, um, I came to school in 1976 and uh, you know, ORU was only about a decade old at that time, and as you can imagine, it being 76, uh, you know, a lot of the ones who came back were from the 60s. And so they would come up to me, again, 1976, they would come up to me and say things like, man, isn't Jesus trippy, you know? And uh, isn't the Holy Spirit groovy, you know? And I think, did anybody normal go to this school in the previous years. Is my class the first Christian class? Did you have to smoke pot back at ORU <laughs> in the day? I mean. Don't go anywhere with that. <laughs> so I appreciate it, although I will tell you that the next of you students who grabs my arm at the side of a road and takes me across that road talking about how you like to ha help the elderly, I'm going to beat you. Okay? <laughs> Let's open our Bibles or turn them on or download them or whatever it is that you're going to do. <laughs> just look up there to um, Joshua chapter 4. Just hold your place there for me. <laughs> Something's happening already. It's awesome. Um, I, uh, let me just start with a little story here about, a little bit about my background. I was. Uh, for a season of my life, uh, raised by an African-American woman. Uh, not because of anything bad, just because of my parents doing other things and diplomatic military stuff. And I, I worshiped her, she was awesome, but she was as big as a house. She, when, when, when she would put her hands on her hips, it was only this, that's all there was because there was nowhere else for the arms to go. Um, and my parents, my parents were uh, thinkers, come from a native, sort of a Native American background, three-quarter Native American. They were, but they were real intellectuals and, and, and thinkers and readers and so on. And so when they disciplined me, they talked me to death. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like if I said a cuss word, I mean, I said a cuss word, it was a bad thing, I shouldn't have done it, I knew I shouldn't have done it. That's the end. There's nowhere else to go. No, no, not for my mother. We are going to have an etymological conversation that's going to go on for 30 years. <laughs> Not this wonderful African-American woman who raised me. She'd say, do you know I will kill you? Do you know I will kill you? I mean, there was, there was no Dr. Phil in that at all. It was just, <laughs> so. I remember that one of the things she used to say uh, back in the day when I would do something, and mainly what I did wrong with her was I stole Oreos. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a whole theology of Oreos um, about, you know, how that, that word being translated means manna and stuff like that. I think really <laughs> Oreos pretty important. So I would steal Oreos and, and then I would lie about it. I'd have, you know, black stuff around my mouth. I'd have two crunched in my hands, like, oh, you know, and so. She, I remember she used to say, you need to remember who you are. 
and, and I mean, I was like four. You know what I mean? I didn't have any idea who I, like there's the womb, there's diapers, there's Oreos. There's not much to remember, you know? But she was, she was enamored of my parents, and so uh, they, they were all very close. And uh, so she would, uh, she would say, you're, you, you know, she'd go off like this, like, your father is Captain Eldon Leroy Mansfield in the United States Army. I mean, you can just picture me in my shorts, my little white legs just sitting on my knees under my chin with my Oreos, and I don't know where this is going. Your mother is a beautiful, she would just take off telling me why I shouldn't steal Oreos because of something that had to do with the Kennedy administration and my, <laughs> you know, something. But, but hey, I bought it. She'd put her hands on her hips, you know, and she would lay into me about how I should remember who I am. Well, obviously that's come back to me through my life, especially in that great Christian movie, The Lion King, in which, in which Mufasa says, remember who you are. <laughs> now, if I was more Oral Roberts, I'd have you turn to your left and say, say, remember who you are. Turn to your right, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not worthy. So I want to talk to you for a few minutes about remembering who you are. And so let's go to Joshua chapter 4 and verse 1. I'm reading from God's version of the Bible, the NIV, and here we go. I'm going to get them all in while I can. With the whole nation, let me just set it up, save us time. Forty years in the wilderness, children of Israel come out of Egypt. God's hacked off at them because of their rebellion and their complaining, so he kills off the, allows the first generation that came out uh, of Egypt to die, and a new generation arises. So now the new generation has arisen, the law has been rearticulated to them, that's what Deuteronomy is. Deuteronomy means second law, as you know, all you theology students. And so the, 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 the law is reclaimed, a, a song of Moses is even sung over them. Uh, I, Joshua is now going to take them into the promised land. And what we're about to read is after they have come down from the plains of Moab, they have come to the Jordan River, and they, are, they have actually already entered into the promised land, just barely, just barely, okay? And this is what happens. When the whole nation, verse 1, had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right, right where the priests are standing, and carry them with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones are to be a, a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Now, there is a difference between monuments and memorials. It's kind of in the etymology of the words. It's represented there. Sometimes they mean the same thing, but in their, their sort of original versions, there's a difference. A monument commemorates something that's happened. A memorial, though, is meant to transmit or radiate the meaning of what has happened for generations to come, or for the next season, or for the next battle, or to our, a destined future. So. There are, there's a valid role for monuments. When you get your degree and you put it on your wall, that is, in a sense, a monument. That is a, a tribute to something that has happened. And you will be thankful and grateful for that your whole life. A memorial would be something different. A memorial would be something, and, and, and again, it doesn't have to be physical, but a memorial would say to you for the rest of your life what your experience meant, what God was doing, how you have declared that at the end of the season that you are in, and thus it radiates meaning for the next seasons of your life. I'll keep coming back to that. So they establish, they, they take the stones out of the Jordan, middle of the Jordan, carry them to uh, the town they're going to spend the night in, which is called Gagal, Gagal, 
depending on how you want to pronounce it. And, uh, and then in Joshua 4.20, it says, and Joshua set up at Gagal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time to, to establish this symbolism, but a monument, again, commemorates what's happened. A memorial speaks of what is about to come. Uh, it speaks the lessons of the previous season to what is destined, what you're called to, what's next. And what is fascinating about what God says to the Israelites uh, through Joshua here in this passage uh, is that that stack of stones, those 12 stones sitting at Gilgal uh, that, that are meant to speak of a certain thing that, that, the, that the Lord speaks of could have represented a lot of things. It could have been a monument to a great many things. It would have been logical, for example, to erect some stones uh, to, to build a monument to the fact that the wanderings were over. Wouldn't that have been wonderful? Hey, it's done. Thank God. For 40 years is over, let's stack up some stones and, and let it radiate that meaning. It might have been uh, that we have, uh, you know, we've come out of this whole Egyptian episode, as historians might say, the Egyptian era. We've come out of that. Uh, you'll see it in a few minutes. Uh, it could have meant that, hey, this manna stuff is finally over and we can eat some real food or whatever, whatever experience they had had, it could have symbolized all of that. But that's not what the Lord said. What the Lord said was, uh, when your children ask what this means, tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones are to be a memorial. So God took their experience wanted something to commemorate it, wanted something to mark it, but wanted to give it a meaning that would allow them to go forward. He didn't make it about even the dead who had fallen in the sands. He did not, and whose bones were then bleaching in the sun. He did not make it about Egypt or coming out of Egypt. He did not make it uh, about the manna being over. He did not make it uh, about the 40 years being over. No, what he made it about was the presence of the Lord going with them so that they could accomplish what they accomplished. Amen. The ark of the Lord, it says, the emphasis is on the ark of the Lord, not on the people, not on their experience necessarily. The ark of the Lord went through the waters, the waters cut off, and that's what I want you to remember. God is saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a memorial to your experience, and I'm going to tell you what's really important about what's been going on. The presence of the Lord has been with you. You would not have come out of Egypt. You would not have survived. You would not have had the miracles. You would not have had the manna and the quail and a billion other things if the Lord had not been with you. So now I want you to remember that. Let's, let's find out why he wants them to remember that. See, memorials radiate the meaning of the past so we can live a destined future. This is important. A memorial takes what has happened in the past and does more than just symbolize it or commemorate it as a past thing. It transmits the meaning of that experience. And that's what God wanted them to remember. I want the generations to come, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, to remember that the presence of the Lord, the ark of the Lord was with you. When the priest carrying it touched the water, that's when the waters parted. When it was with you, when the presence of the Lord was with you, pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, all of that kind of thing, that's what the emphasis was. And so future generations then would remember, and remembering is an important duty and discipline in the Bible, would reclaim and would renew based on what that memorial captured for them. Okay, I'm coming. I know. I can see some squirming. Just hang on. I'm just setting it up, okay? That's how we did it back when giants roamed the campus, all right? <laughs> we used to have to kill bears between the dorm and the LRC. It was an awesome time, all right? <laughs> so once, once they get to Gilgal, once they build this monument to the presence of the Lord in their midst that is intended not just for them for generations to come, new things start happening. I'll just list them quickly. Uh, for, for example, once they pile those stones, they circumcise the men for the first time in their generation, entering them into covenant with God. Uh, then, right after that, uh, the calendar rolls over to the beginning of the year. It's an important symbolism in the Scriptures, as those of you know who are into uh, hermeneutics and are, and are being taught well. Uh, then they celebrated the Passover for the first time in 39 years. They had not celebrated the Passover as they roamed through the wilderness 
uh, through the wilds, and they come into the land, they symbolize this thing, they build this memorial, and new things start happening. Now the Passover is being celebrated for the first time in 39 years, okay? Then God says, I have removed the reproach of Egypt from you. In fact, uh, it's likely that the city of Gilgal, the place of Gilgal, was named at that moment because Gilgal means to roll. And it likely comes from this phrase, I have rolled the reproach of Egypt from you. That's likely where Gilgal got its name. And then, of course, finally, the manna ceases. And the people begin to eat from what? From the fruit of the land of promise. Now, I'm not just preaching here, I'm going somewhere, and so I want to, I want to tell you, that made it sound like preaching never goes anywhere, that's not exactly what I meant, but I, <laughs> it was a transitional phrase, what can I say? God is about remembrance in the Scriptures. He's about remembrance often. He wants you to remember right so that you have in your heart and your soul the meaning of the past so that you can fashion the future he's ordained for you. If you don't remember right, and this is, this is just right for us here at Homecoming, if you don't remember right, if you don't recall the proper lesson, if you recall inappropriately or wrongly or in a misguided fashion or in a deceived fashion, you will carry the wrong lessons and thus the wrong inspiration into the next season of your life. This is all through the Scriptures, very, very briefly. The, the, the priests of the Old Testament used to wear stones symbolizing the 12 tribes on their, on their breastplate. What was it? They were called stones of remembrance. That's what God does. God was so concerned about the non-Israelites, uh, the Gentiles, that He gave them, quote-unquote, a memorial in the temple when it came along because He wanted them not to feel like they were absent from a heritage and a history. So He gave them a memorial in the temple as, as a way of saying, you too have part in this history and this heritage. Heritage. Uh, even by the New Testament, Acts chapter 10, the angel goes to Cornelius, a Roman a centurion, a Roman uh, officer, and says to him, your gifts and offerings to the poor have come up to the Lord as a, what? A memorial offering. And then the Gentile Pentecost happens in his living room. Why? Because he had engaged in actions that said, God is remembering. And I'm remembering too. And then human beings pick this thing up. It's unbelievable. You, you know these stories. Jacob uh, took a stone, set it up as a pillar, said to his rel relatives, gather some other stones. They put the stones in a heap, and then Laban says, this heap is a witness between us today. So the stacking of stones, the building of a memorial to radiate purpose and meaning and what would come, and, and, and importance to what would come after was critical. And then, of course, you all know this one, and I hope that you, have, you hold it before the Lord all the time. Samuel 7 and verse 12. Uh, then Samuel took a stone, sat it up between Mizbah and Shen, and he named it Ebenezer and said, Thus far has the Lord helped us. The people of God were always, throughout Scripture, asked to make a memorial as one season transitioned to another. And the meaning of that memorial was what God wanted the people to remember. In fact, I could go off now on a long riff about how many times in the Bible, as God is about to do something new, He tells them to remember. You look at the Scriptures. You start reading the Scriptures in that light. He's about to take the people into, into the land. Remember this. Remember this. Remember the right things. Time and time again, when God is about to do something new, He prepares the people for it, by telling them to remember the right things and the right lessons from the memorials that have been established previously. Now, we don't live that way for the most part. We're busy moderns, and so we rush from place to place to place without a lot of sense of, uh, of the moment, without a lot of sense of commemoration or, or, or memorialization. We, we tend to move from thing to thing. And I, I want to suggest uh, that while we're not talking about physical uh, uh, memorials and we're not talking about stacking stones or putting a plaque on the wall, we are talking about the need to rightly understand what God has done in the seasons of your life and somehow declare yourself in it so that you do not live a warped, misguided, wrongly remembered existence from that time forward. And that's what I want to talk to you about right now just for, just for the next two, three hours. Uh, <laughs> we change relationships. We change jobs. We change, we change places. We have change forced on us, firings, divorces, whatever happens. We move on, we draw the wrong conclusions, we draw the wrong lessons, and what happens? 
What happens is that we remember the wrong things and we deform uh, our future. Let me just give you four or five quick little things. I was going to have a seven-point sermon, uh, but the anointing wasn't that strong because God only moves in seven points. <laughs> Three points are for Baptists, seven points are for just play. All right, so number one, I heard that stony silence. Please hear me because obviously I'm setting all of this up to speak to you about the themes that we're all contemplating around homecoming. And for those of you who are graduating and all the transitions of our lives, number one is this, very quickly. Memorials radiate the meaning of the former season for the next season of our lives. You see, when God said to the people of Israel, the memorial that is built here at Gagal is transmitting to you the fact and is meant to be remembered by you in the sense that there is there is this tremendous ark and presence of God that has been with you, that has, that has opened the sea and has done these mighty miracles. When that happened, why did God emphasize the ark? How many of you know the story and what's going to come next? They're going to be at Gilgal, and God is then going to have them do what? Go towards Jericho. Well, what's the key to victory at Jericho? The key to victory at Jericho is not that the people of Israel are awesome and great warriors. The key to Israel, a victory in Jericho is what? That they carry the ark of the Lord around the city. So had they not understood correctly their history, had they not understood correctly what came before, that the ark was the key to all they had experienced, that the presence of God was the deal, they would not have understood properly what was coming next, and that was God's method of achieving victory in the next season of their life as they took the land. So you, you have got to build, and I'll tell you about it how in just a moment, you have got to build memorials. What does that mean? Again, it's not the stacking of stones or the nailing to the wall of, of, of a plaque. It's simply coming to the point where you turn and look at your experience, the conclusion of a season, the transitions of life, the things that are going to happen. And don't just quickly run and rush by it or draw conclusions that are rooted in bitterness and anger and, and disappointment, but instead... Go before the Lord, maybe stand with some friends, de to declare what is important about this, declare what God has been doing, build a memorial of faith, build a memorial in the spirit that you can refer to time after time after time. This is what God has done. This is what this has meant. Now, I understand we all see through a glass darkly, and we're all idiots about our experience when we're living through it. But you declare what you know, and it evolves over time as the Holy Spirit gives you insight. Amen. Some of you are going to graduate this spring. Not all of you who think you are, but some of you. <laughs> what has ORU meant? If it's just the uh, acquiring of a diploma, that's, that's the monument. The memorial is what God has done. What, what has it meant? Can you take a moment? Can you, can, can, you can you declare as though you were stacking 12 stones a memorial to what it has meant? I'm not going to give you a lot of other stuff. We've got to move on. But I, I came to ORU. I got saved here three days into the experience. I, I learned leadership here. I was an RA, a head RA, uh, a dorm director. I, I, I learned. I got saved. And 24 hours later, they had me in Francis Schaefer lectures, for heaven's sakes. Um, <laughs> I learned. I grew. When I left ORU, it, it scared me to be approaching the end of ORU because I didn't feel like I'd gotten everything God wanted. It was something. I just was, I'd been so changed. But I, but I, but I walked out. Where is it from here? I'm, I'm lost. The Avenue of Flags behind what we used to call Howard Auditorium. Is that this way? All the alums are going, idiot. It's over here. <laughs> and, and, and I walked out there to a place I had prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed all of my time at ORU. I stood out there kind of in the dark, away from the lights that illuminate the buildings. I looked at the Avenue of Flags. Uh, the massive hands were there only in the spirit. And, and, and I, I looked at the flags, and I, and I said, as I had, I had prayed there hour by hour by hour by hour, I am, from this point forward, about those nations. That's what you brought me here for. You changed me, you fixed me, you healed me, you gave me mentors, you gave me older brothers, you gave me professors, you taught me things, you put me in a humanities lecture at 7.50 in the morning, okay? <laughs> Clearly there's a reason. And I declared it. I have lived out of the radiation of that message since. Not perfectly. See, the problem is that if you don't declare the right thing, this is number two, I'm going to move very quickly now. If you don't declare the right thing, you'll conclude the wrong thing. I, uh, I have a friend who, who graduated 
from ORU. He had been the high school star. You know what I'm talking about, good looking, homecoming, you know, everything, pontiff and what have you. He was the, he was the awesome kid. He was the baseball star, the acting star, and the, the tremendous, uh, everybody loved him. He was the most likely to accomplish everything in the whole wide world, and, and uh, he came to ORU. Well, he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't a star anymore. And so he spent four years here. He had a great education, had good friends. But by the time it was over, he had really concluded that God had rejected him here because it hadn't been high school. So he goes off, he gets in ministry. Uh, he, he's, he's, he's telling somebody this from ORU years later, having concluded that the meaning of ORU, the, 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 the monument's on his wall, but the meaning was four years of rejection. His friend, being like my friend, says, you're an idiot. That's how most godly counsel begins in my life. You are a foo. And what did he say? He said, God didn't take you to ORU to reject you. God took you to ORU to break you because he wanted to use you. That's good. Now, I'm not preaching breakings. I'm saying this kid had wrongly memorialized his experience. And he was living in the afterglow of that for the rest of his life. You gotta, you gotta take some time to put it in right perspective, memorialize it. There are people who have come to this school, had marvelous experiences, and gone on and done great things. Then there are people who have come to this school and concluded wrongly, concluded angrily, uh, ang angrily uh, lived in bitterness because they, they memorialized the wrong things about their experience. And as a result, they've lived beneath their call. Then, if you memorialize, this is number three, I'm, I'm, merging, I'm, below, I'm shoving them all together, given the numbers that I'm looking at by the camera. Uh, you, you memorialize the wrong things, you set yourself up. One of the experiences that was really defining uh, in my generation at ORU uh, was that one of our favorite guys uh, got in trouble and was going to be fined. Well, he had no money, so to fine him was to kick him out of school. That was a bummer. We, back then, we, did, we weren't as rich as you guys, and so we had to, you know, like pray for toothpaste and pray for pizza and stuff like that. And, and so this guy, for him to be fined $100 meant he was going to get kicked out. And so we were mad. Man, we were mad in a way that, you, you know, just only Christians can get mad. And we, we were hacked off. And so one of my friends said, I went up there to the LRC, you know, close to the president's office where they were having this meeting, whether they're going to find this guy or not. And he said, while I sat there, I, I knew I could see it happening. I was going to get mad. I was going to yell at somebody. I was going to leave ORU. I was going to be bitter forever. I was going to talk about the place. I was going to lead protests. I was, he could just, the whole thing was there in his mind as he sat in the LRC waiting for the first, I guess it was a board member or whatever, to come out and to smack them verbally. His friend came out in tears. He said, did they find you? His friend said, yes. My friend said, and later, I thought at that moment, I'm leading a riot. We will burn this place to the ground. <laughs> the next guy out the door was Oral Roberts. And that changed, uh, like the mood, real quick. And then... <laughs> But my friend was about ready to give Oral Roberts an earful when Oral Roberts reached in his pocket, pulled out a $100 bill, slid it in the kid's pocket, and walked on. So you have a choice, don't you? You live the rest of your life hacked off and bitter because you've memorialized the wrong thing, or you can step back just a little bit and go, well, you know, not everything maybe as I like it, but this right here was awesome. That's how we say it in Texas. This here, this here is awesome, all right? You can also build a memorial when there isn't one. I have a friend who was fired from a job, fired unrighteously, horribly bloody, terrible thing. He'd served well. It was a bad situation. But he knew this message. He knew this meaning. And he did not want to leave having memorialized bitterness and anger and, and strife. And so what did he do? He went and started shaking everybody's hand. Thank you for the chance to be here. It's been awesome. I, you have, I have learned so much. God has really used this in my life. Thanks for being an instrument. And me talking to a bunch of pagans. They don't even know what he's talking about. But that doesn't matter. The important thing is what he's saying. Thank you. Bless you. Finally, the boss got so moved. He said, can I bring everybody together so you can talk to them for a few minutes? So he, he, uh, he talks to them. And just I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you, God using you in my life. And this is awesome. What was he doing? He was building a memorial to character and honor and cleanness. Did he get his job back? Is that the testimony I'm going to give now? No, no, no. He didn't want that job. He got a better job and later bought the company. Why? Because he had built a memorial. He had built a memorial. What he's doing? He didn't memorialize, I hate them. I'm angry at them. I'm bitter at them. They stink. He didn't memorialize all that. 
he built a better memorial out of his experience than the one he had known. And then the final thing, and I'm going to turn myself left to where I see most of the alumni, it's never too late. I'm not trying to preach at you. We all have to do this all the time. It's never too late to build a better memorial than the one you built before to a season of your life. Now, you are going to go through hard times. The Bible says you will go through many troubles to enter the kingdom. You're going to have some difficulties. I'm not cursing you. You're going to have some hardship. There are going to be a few divorces. There are going to be some tough stuff. Some of you are going to lose jobs. And, and th- you know, it's just going to happen. We know we're Christians. We're not immune from life, right? And so things are going to happen. And, and one of the reasons you may have had a few knocks here at ORU, and I don't know, I'm just making this up, but you may have had a few knocks at ORU, is that God wants you to learn now how to memorialize in your life the right things. Not, not, not some kind of, you know, oh, everything's fine, everything's, you know, just some kind of silly faith game. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about looking at what God has done and saying, oh, there was this and this hurt and that was bad and that professor wasn't all, you know, and all that kind of thing. Sorry, profs. But here's what God did. I declare it. I nail it down. It radiates into my life. We all know, those of us who are older, or are you grads who have got the wrong stuff radiating into their lives? And I got to tell you, it has, they have not been right since they walked their line, got their diploma, and walked out. They need a new memorial over this season of their lives. So you, you, you kids graduating this spring, you know, we Americans, we tend to just say, well, I'll, I'll call you sometime soon. There are people who are significant parts of your life you will never see again. Put your arm around them. Thank them for God's, God's, their, their role in your life. Bless them. Build a memorial between the two of you so if you never see each other again, it is breathing something glorious and righteous into your life. That's powerful. That's important for you to do. Life is unfair. Sometimes, as we learned last night, referees are demon-possessed. That's just the way it goes. Build a better memorial. Now look at me. Look at me now. Here's how we do this in my charismatic Anglican church in Nashville. May the Lord bless you. May He give you grace to build the memorials in your life that will radiate God's purposes for your destiny. May you be free of the negative memorials that you have built. And may you take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of you. Amen.